So it was uh, November 1997 when I got this t-shirt. I was a student down at New Mexico State, and I got this shirt in November of 1997. And when I first met my wife, I, I used to play basketball in this shirt quite a bit. Actually, I've played a lot of basketball in this shirt. And I, 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 when I first met her in 99, she really liked the way that this shirt looked on me. I still wear this shirt in 2021. That's 24 years almost now. That may be a problem, right? There, there may be a problem. Oh, I, I like it. I got one person shaking her head no. How many of you guys still have shirts from when you were in college? We got a couple, three, four, right? The rest of us, well, you're smart enough to get rid of shirts. I have played thousands of hours of basketball in this t-shirt, right? My wife actually wore this t-shirt when she had kids that are now like six foot nine, right? So, so she wore this t-shirt when she was pregnant with those kids. This shirt has been through a lot, but I'm the type of person who's not going to let it go, right? I'm the type of person who's going to hold on to it because I like old things, it sounds bad, but I like it. I like to have things that, that, that have been around for a while. I like to remember stuff. I like to have stuff that, that's going to remind me of where I was before. I like stories. I like pictures. Um, my dad actually called, called me here a couple days ago. And just to let you guys know that the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, my dad and I talked for an hour and a half. Basically, he talked about old stuff from the farms back in like the 30s and 40s and 50s in South Dakota, and I sat and I listened to it, and I never got bored for a second because I like old things. Not all of us are that way, right? Some of us are the other way. We like the new stuff. We like to have uh, the newest thing when it comes out. We want to be able to get the newest, well, how many of you guys have the newest phone? Not because you had to have the newest phone, because your other phone worked, but you could, Right? Well, nobody's going to raise their hand. I guess we are all old thing people. I like it. I like it. Uh, but we, have, we live in a culture that teaches us that we have to have the new because the new is better. The new is, new is great. But I, I'm an old thing person. Right? I, I like to have things that remind me of, of where, where it was before. Now, it's a big deal, not necessarily with a t-shirt, but it's a big deal in some other ways. It's a big deal when, uh, when things go crazy. It's been a year like right at a year ago, um, right now, we, we stopped being able to meet together um, in this building as a church. It's been a year, and, and when that happened a year ago, we, as a church, tried to lock in on what we knew was good. We, we locked in on praying together. We locked in on spending time uh, in the Word together online because we couldn't do this. We couldn't do what we were used to, so we tried to focus on what we knew to work. We tried to focus on what we knew was good, and I think we made the right decision but I don't know that it's always the right decision to focus on what we know works. This week, we're going to uh, start a series called Kingdom Basics, the, the basic understanding of how to live in the, as the kingdom of God. And Jesus, today, in the, in the, the passage we're going to be studying, is going to challenge the way that we look at walking with God. He's going to challenge the way that we understand walking with God, and he's going to challenge it in a way that I think is a little uncomfortable because he's going to say, look, the old that you understand doesn't necessarily mean right. The uh, kingdom of God isn't defined by our rational understanding of what is right. Just because it makes sense to us doesn't mean that it's the right decision to make. And with the context of your, let me just fill you guys in on where we're at as we get ready to jump into the Word. Last week, Brandon shared with us uh, about a guy named Levi. Levi was a tax collector. He was seen as an evil man within his, in his society, as a traitor. He was making money off of his people to send off to the evil government of Rome. And he was taking advantage of people. Jesus, in that environment, reached out to Levi and said, come and follow me. And Levi left his tax collecting, and, and became a follower of Jesus. But m not only did, did he leave, he invited Jesus into his house so that there could be a party with other evil tax collectors. And so Jesus is hanging out with these people that everybody would consider to be evil. Just about everybody in this society. And Jesus is hanging out with them. In that, we're going to pick up today. With people watching Jesus seeing Jesus hanging out with people who are evil, seeing Jesus' followers doing things that don't make sense. And so they're going to try and find reasons to call Jesus out. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles uh, to Mark chapter 2. Uh, Mark chapter 2, we're going to be picking up in verse 18. And as you're going there, just understand, 
They have just seen Jesus hanging out with these tax collectors. The religious leaders have, the good people have. And they ask Jesus, why do you hang out with such scum? Actually, that's the word, uh, that we've, the picture that we have here. And with that picture, we're going to see them call out Jesus in this. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 18, says this. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and, and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? All right, let, let's, uh, let's get something clear about this here. We need to talk a little bit about fasting, what, what this has to do with anything. Fasting, what is it? Fasting is, is choosing to not eat or to give up something so that you will put your heart in a right, right relationship with God so that when, when the hunger pangs hit you, you start to realize, I'm going to trust in in God for my spiritual nourishment instead of the physical nourishment that will fill my stomach, right? That's that's basically what you're doing when you're fasting. And and in this culture that they were in, the good religious people would fast twice a week. They would fast on Tuesdays and they would fast on Fridays, right? So they would spend this time not eating so that theoretically they could draw into right relationship with God. The people watching Jesus' followers happened to notice something as Jesus was sitting there and he was eating with these sinners, with these terrible people. Wait a second. Why aren't they fasting like the rest of us? Why are they doing something that the rest of us would never do? I mean, good, godly people would be fasting right now. A couple things we need to understand. The Old Testament only commanded people to fast one day a year. But they had developed this type of doctrinal understanding that any really good person is going to fast well is going to fast twice a week the fasting is a gift of god that, that god gave to give clarity to our to the prayers right fasting was something that god gave these people so that their their prayers would be right their hearts would be right but they had taken it and they had turned it into a way to justify themselves around other people, right? They had turned it into a way, instead of drawing closer to God, they had turned it into a way to keep score. So that gets us the basis of what we need to understand. We need to understand today that what we're looking at is people who are keeping score. And what do I mean by keeping score? Simplest illustration I can give you. My wife is not in here right now, but she was in here last service, and she, I don't think she's going to kill me, so we're good to go. So I should be back next week. With that in mind, I keep score with my wife all the time. My wife is, well, I'm a morning person, right? I get up in the morning, I, can, I get up, I have a cup of coffee. Um, actually, while the coffee is brewing, I'm building a fire in the, in the wood stove. I don't want to sound like a hero because I'm about to show you why I'm not. Um, but I do that because I like mornings. So I get up, I build a fire, I drink my coffee, I'm, I'm reading, it's great. My wife is less so, right? A lot less so. She doesn't like morning. She gets up in mornings because she has to. But she gets up in the morning, and, and so she'll come down, and, and it's this way where I'm excited and, and happy, and, and she's not so much. So when she walks down, down the stairs, if I say good morning to her and she hasn't had coffee yet, she looks at me and says, you need to relax, right? This is, this is where she is compared to where I am. Well, here's the thing. If she looks at me and doesn't say, good morning, in my mind, if I'm not careful, I'm thinking, I'm winning one to nothing. I guess it's going to be a, mad mo- a bad morning, and we're, we're, we're kind of arguing through this. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm already doing pretty well, because I showed her that I care, and she's not. So. And if, if by chance she then goes and grabs her coffee and sits on the couch that's not right next to me, I'm thinking, oh, we are fighting. 2-0, Jim's winning. Pretty quickly, right, the score starts to add up. And I'm not telling you, I'm not, this, I'm not being facetious, I'm not exaggerating. This is what's going on in my mind. Pretty quickly, if she gets up to go to work, and we haven't talked about how great the fire is that I built, how warm it is in the house because I made it warm. I'm up like four or five to nothing. She goes off to work, I go off to work, we come back home. She's not a morning person, but she's an afternoon person. So we come in, and, and she comes, and she says, hey, how's it going? How was your day? I'm thinking in my mind. This is li- I'm not making this up. I'm thinking in my mind, oh, now you want to be nice. 
I'm already up like 25 to nothing. You're not catching up in this score. I wish it wasn't true, but this is how my brain works. I've got my own acts of righteousness that I have done that have shown me why, I'm, why I am better than the people around me. Jesus had just called Levi this horrible, terrible person who was far from God by every measurable standard of the Jewish culture. This guy said, I'm no longer going to do what it is that everybody thinks is so evil, and I'm just going to follow Jesus. And the people around didn't care. All they cared about was that Jesus' disciples were not fasting because they were. Why does that matter? Because it shows them that they're better than Jesus' disciples. 2,000 years ago, this is what people did. They looked at other people who who seemed to be following God in ways that they weren't, and they found reasons why they were still better than those people. They lived in a culture where they searched for reasons why they were better than everybody else around them. They kept score. Thankfully, we don't live in that world anymore. It's very easy for us, if we're being honest, to do the same thing, to find ourselves keeping score, to find ourselves finding reasons why it is that we're not as bad as the people around us, or we're better than the people around us, or at least we're doing this. I may not be a great Christian man, but at least I'm not that guy. And in that picture, Jesus says something that's really great. He's going to talk about fasting, but it's going to speak into the whole thing. So look at verse 19 and 20. He says, And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. So he says, Why would the wedding guests fast when the bridegroom is with them? There will be a day when that guy's not there with them, and then they will fast. Why do we fast? Like I said earlier, we fast so that our hearts would be focused on God, so that our hearts would be drawn to God, so that our hearts would be reminded that it's not all about me, that the world does not exist for my pleasure, that I exist actually for and because of the goodness of God. I, I want to notice what Jesus doesn't say first. First off, he doesn't look at the people and said, your rules are dumb. The Bible says that you only have to fast once a year, and instead you guys are fasting twice a week. You guys are stacking rules on top of rules, which is a problem that he deals with all the time with then. Instead, what he says is, instead of saying the what of what they were doing, he points them to the why. He says, look, they're fast. We fast. We fast because we want to draw close to God. Jesus points the people to the why of fasting instead of the what of fasting. He says, they don't need to fast right now because the Son of God is right here with them. The why of fasting is that we can draw closer to God. It's not so that we can look good, so that we can prove ourselves to everyone around us. It's so that our hearts can be right. What Jesus is calling them to do, what Jesus is saying to these people, is that the reason we fast is to take our eyes off ourselves and to turn them on God. This is a hard thing. Because we live in a world and we live with a nature that constantly wants to look at ourselves. It's in every area of your life that you find yourself doing this, if you're like me, and you probably are better than me. But there are ways that I do this all the time. Like I've said before, when I'm driving down the road, Every person that drives by me faster than I'm going is a maniac, and every person who's driving slower than me is an idiot. I'm constantly drawn to the way that I'm better than every person around me when it comes to these things. And it's not just in driving. It's in every area of life. If we're not careful, we are constantly put to the place where we're thinking about ourselves and how it matters to everybody else. And what Jesus is saying with fasting 
with this place where these people were keeping score is, why are we doing it in the first place? So that we may know God. The reason that we're here today the reason that we, we sing praises to God, the reason we sing, oh, how great your love is, how strong your kindness, how, how sweet your grace, the reason we sing these things isn't to make ourselves sound good, it isn't to make ourselves look good, it is so that we may know God. But the problem is, the problem that we have is, is, is this, that, that it's just easier. Focusing on what is, the, the, what the what is, is always is just what we're comfortable doing. We're very comfortable focusing on what we should do. We don't focus on the why very well. So we always compare ourselves to others. But with that, Jesus then says something really cool. Verse 21 and 22. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the, old wi or the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Now this, this sounds crazy. It doesn't make a lot of sense. He's talking about fasting and all of a sudden he's talking about like clothes and he's talking about wineskins. What is he talking about here? Well, let me share with you guys the literal point, and then I'm going to share with you, or the, the, the literal picture, and then I'm going to share with you what he's talking about here. So this shirt right here is old. It's just old, right? It, it's very old. And if, I, if, if it gets a hole in it, my wife is going to throw it away, so I'm not ever going to let this thing get a hole in it, because I love the shirt. But if it got a hole in it, and I tried to patch it with new cloth, what would happen? You guys that know anything about laundry, what happens the first time you wash clothes? They shrink, Right? That was true 2,000 years ago. It's, two, it's true today. If I if sew, sew a new piece of clothing on here, it's going to pull in and it's going to tear away from the clothing. All right, wineskins are the same way. Wineskins were actually, you, you picture like a bladder and, and you would fill a bladder with new wine and a new uh, skin, like a literal bladder, would swell as the wine would ferment. This new, wine, this new skin was, was very flexible, very malleable, and it would swell as the new wine would ferment. And then when you went to pour the wine, it was fermented and it was good. Once you've had wine in that skin and it's swollen, it can't swell anymore. If you put new wine into the skin, old skin, it's now old and dry and no longer malleable. And it would crack and burst as the wine started to ferment inside it. What does that have to do with this teaching? A lot. Jesus was bringing something to the table that would have been a new teaching for all these people. He's teaching that even the tax collectors can be forgiven. He's teaching that it's not about the fasting that's going to save us. It's not about how good we are. It's about who he is. He's, he's teaching this thing that ended up being a thing that was really flowed throughout his teaching. It actually flows throughout the entire totality of the Old Testament. He teaches this idea that uh, our entire life is built around two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets are summed up in this. He's teaching this idea that following God isn't how good we look to other people. It's about loving other people and following God. This new teaching inside the old belief system that the people had was not possible. 2,000 years ago, these people had this belief system about keeping score. That if they kept score and they won, that meant they were justified. And Jesus is saying, you can't be justified by that system and then live underneath this new teaching. You can't be justified by that system of I'm winning and everybody else is losing and then be justified by this new teaching of, of the grace of God that saves you. If you're justified by that new system, you're not going to be ex able to accept that a guy like Levi can be accepted by God. In fact, we're going to see here in just a couple weeks that it's this new system that the people can't stand. There, there's there's going to be a guy here in just a couple weeks who is, who is crippled and his hand is crippled and he can't do anything with it. And it's a Sabbath day and Jesus looks at the guy and, and he knows what the people are thinking. He thinks, they think if, if Jesus heals this guy on the Sabbath, he's working on the Sabbath and he's a terrible person. So there's no way he can do it. And Jesus 
looks at them and he gets angry and he looks at the guy and he heals the guy and his hand opens up and the people all around don't say, that was amazing, I love it, this guy is healed. Instead, they look at the guy, they see his hand open up and they say, we gotta kill Jesus because Jesus is ruining our system. Why does that matter? Because we love our scoreboards. We love our scoreboards. We love being able to know why it is that we're doing better than the people around us. And God wants to abolish them. We love knowing that what we are doing is good and what we're doing makes us better. But when we care more about what we do than why we do it, we can no longer love as God loves. When we care more about whether we're doing good and we're looking good and, and, and we're, we're justified in front of people and, and people applaud us and they say, that's a good guy, that guy's a great guy, he's doing great. When we care more about those things than about the why, we can't love as God loves. And so where does that leave us? Being good isn't the point. Being forgiven is. If you're here today because you want to be good, I applaud you. You're trying. Trying hard. And if we're honest, many of us have been there. We tried to be a good person. We tried to be a better person. We wanted to do better. We didn't want to say the wrong things. We didn't want to look at the wrong things. We didn't want to focus on the wrong things. We're tired of being addicted to the wrong things. And so we decided, I'm going to stop doing that thing. But the more you decide to stop doing it, the more you find yourself thinking about it, which means you do it more because it's on your mind all the time. And what Jesus did he said, I know I've got a better way. But we have to face the reality. And it comes out of Luke chapter 5, verse 39. Uh, Luke gives us a little bit more about what Jesus said at the very end of this. In Luke 5, 39, he says this, And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. He says this, Nobody, after having a good glass of old wine, is going to want new wine anyway. Because the old just tastes better. What does that have to do with context? Once you've lived underneath the scoreboard, you're going to think the scoreboard's better than not having the scoreboard. You just are. Because you like it. We all know that this is the truth, right? I'm not, I'm not up here breaking ground with this sermon today. When I say that it's not our job to sit and, and to try and compare ourselves to others and use that to prove how great we are, most of us know that that's the truth. But we're going to do it. We're going to go home and we're going to turn on the news and we're going to look and say, look at all those idiots out there doing their idiot things in their idiot ways. I'm sure glad I'm not them. Am I right? This is the where we are. This is our world. This is the world that we live in. We live in a world that teaches us that the only way to win is to prove that everybody else is a loser. And Jesus knew that that day as he's talking to these people. He said, look, I'm giving you a new teaching. I'm giving you one that's going to set you free. But most everybody sitting in that space around him was just going to stay doing the same thing. Because it's hard. It's much more comfortable, much more comfortable to keep score than it is to simply follow God. But this is the thing that makes this so beautiful. When you let go of the scoreboard, you don't have to win anymore. The grace of Jesus the grace of Jesus means I don't have to compare myself to people anymore. The grace of Jesus means I don't have to live underneath this structure where I'm comparing myself to people anymore, and that's a beautiful thing. 
Because I'm going to share with you guys honestly what happens at the end of my scoreboard day with my wife. If I spend all day long trying to compare myself to others and find value in that, figuring out how I win, there's a lot of days that I win. But you know what happens when I wake up the next morning? I got to go do it again. And I'm actually darker the next day than I was the day before. As long as I'm keeping score, I'm underneath this broken place that I can't ever get out of. And so here's my bottom line for you guys today. Following Jesus changes everything that I think I know. Right? It changes everything that I think I understand. When I think that that the point is me keeping score, Jesus says, no, it's not. He asks us to change the way that we see the world. Two boys. Two boys are uh, sitting there and they're about to have breakfast. And this happens at my house all the time. Honestly, this is a picture at my house, right? Uh, they, they, they sit down and they, they, two brothers, they pour one bowl of cereal. There's only enough cereal and milk for one bowl, right? That happens all the time, right? They pour one, one bowl of cereal and, and they, they sit down and they have the bowl of cereal. And the mom says, I got a teachable moment right here. So she walks up to her boys and they're, they're yelling at each other about who's going to get the last bowl of cereal. And the mom looks at the boys and she says, boys, if, if Jesus was here, what do you think Jesus would do? And the boys look, and they put their head down, and they say, he'd share with his brother. And one of them looks at the other one and says, that's right, you be Jesus. <laughs> right? This is the reality of the world that we live in. We know what we should do, and we like it when other people do it. But we can't seem to do it. Back when I got this shirt, uh, in November of 1997, I was in a really dark place. I didn't realize it. I didn't realize how dark it was. But I was running as fast as I could, as far from God, and I still felt like I was doing the right thing. I was running, and I was seeking everything I could to make myself feel better. I was in college. I was trying to, everything that you can think of is what I was trying to fill myself with. And my world got darker and darker and darker until one day, right Right at the end of the the semester, uh, I hit rock bottom. I hit a place where I felt like my world was going to end. There had been some really bad news on some decisions I had made, and I thought I had no hope. I thought I had no hope. Sitting there on on the dorm room floor Tuesday night of finals week, I prayed God. For the first time in my life, I prayed in this way. God, I'm sorry about where I am and who I am, and I'm done. Whatever happens to me from this point forward, I'm yours. And it was in that moment that I was realizing how much of a loser I am. That I am a loser. But the most beautiful thing about that moment is as I prayed, God, please forgive me. Whatever, ha- whatever happens to me from this point forward, I'm yours. I felt this weight lift off of my shoulders and a freedom like nothing I've ever had before. It was in that moment that I realized that I was a loser, but it was also in that moment that I realized that God loves me even though I'm a loser. In that moment when you realize that God loves you even though you are a loser, even though you have not accomplished anything that amazing, that's the moment you get set free. Because you can turn off the scoreboard because you realize you're not winning it anyway. And you realize even though I'm not winning, God still is allowing me to win. I am standing here today because God has redeemed that prayer from 1997. This is what God does. This is how God does. He sets us free of this place where we feel like we need to compare ourselves to everybody else. He sets us free of this place where we feel like we just got to prove it to him how we are good Christian people, how I'm a good boy and I'm a good girl and I'm this. It's not about being good. It's about being forgiven. The religious leaders followed rules that made sense to them, but they were never going to get what it is they were after. So here's what I want to ask you to do. How I want to ask you to own this, how you can live this out. One, find your value in who he is, not who you are. 
That means understanding that you don't have all the answers and yet God still loves you. You don't have all the answers and yet God has powerfully called you out of this world. So you don't have to be proven by your structure or, or, or by your personal identity. But whether you're tall, short, big, little, whatever color, whatever uh, structure you have built yourself under that you have found your value in. That God has made you something better because of what Jesus is doing. And until you give up trying to prove yourself by who you are, it's going to be a dry well. So find your value in the fact that the God of the universe calls you a son or a daughter if you're a follower of him. And one last thing I want to ask you to do. One last day to own it. I want to ask you to fast. I want to ask you to fast. I want to ask you to, even if it means setting a, a reminder in your phone, to, to take one day this week, maybe one meal even, and spend that time asking God to, to show his purpose to you. As your stomach starts to growl, like mine does, because I'm not built for fasting, um, as your stomach starts to growl and as your stomach starts to yell at you, realize your nourishment isn't going to come from fulfilling what it is that your body wants. But your nourishment is from something greater anyway. Let God give you a divine purpose. Let's pray. Almighty God, I thank you. I thank you that, that you are so good to us, that you, you, you show us where we are. And you love us anyway. Mighty God, I pray that you would please forgive us for trying to prove ourselves to you, for trying to, to prove ourselves to other people, for attaching ourselves to different plays of, of identity as a way to find our value. God, help us to attach ourselves to you and you only. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.